Before I begin my sermon, I am happy to announce to you that after several delays and a lot of hard work and planning, uh, the chapel in the woods is now open, and we're very excited about that. Uh, it, is, it is located about two blocks from the entrance number five here at Blankenbaker, and the chapel will primarily be used for weddings and funeral services, but it also affords us the opportunity to utilize this space for special programming, for worship venues, for senior adults, for young people. Uh, the project has been done with excellence, not opulence. It is functional, and the look and feel will remind many of you of, of maybe a church that you grew up in uh, when you were younger. Uh, and this is a very strong statement uh, that we see great value in being a multi-generational church. Our college-age ministry had a worship service in there last Sunday night, uh, and it's a unique setting that we think can serve us really well for many years to come. Our elders had a prayer time of dedication uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I can't wait to see how it's gonna be used in so many different ways. You'll also be glad to know that the chapel in the woods has been paid for in full. So that's always a good, good relief. Uh, but that is thank, uh, we, we express thanks to you for your faithful and consistent and generous giving. And our elders were wise the last four years, each year to set aside some monies uh, for this, for when it would um, be built and completed. And uh, so we're excited that we can still be debt free, uh, even with that building. Uh, due to the size of the facility, we couldn't have one dedication event, so we're inviting people, if you'd like to swing by sometime this week, starting on Monday, uh, so Monday through Wednesday, or on, or on Friday, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., if you wanna swing by and take a look for about 10 minutes, feel free to do that. I think you'll really enjoy uh, a walkthrough of it. And then beginning this Thursday, and every Thursday after that, uh, the senior adults will be using uh, this building for their classic worship service that meets at 10 a.m. each Thursday. And they sing hymns and have a lesson, and it's a great time of fellowship. So I want to make certain that you know that, that that's available. You can read more about the Chapel in the Woods and the Outlook. Well, this is a weekend. This is a weekend where somewhere between 100 million and 110 million people will tune in to the biggest TV event of the year. I understand that there's even a football game that will be interspersed <laughs> between the Super Bowl commercials. This year, the average cost of a commercial that lasts 30 seconds is $5.25 million, all right? That's how much it will set back an organization or yourself if you choose to have a, a commercial. And if you are fortunate enough to sometime land a ticket for the big show, and if you were to step out of the action and go to the concession stand for just a few minutes uh, and got a hot dog, nachos, and a soft drink, it would set you back around 27 bucks. But if the lines were long and you missed a good portion of the game, as you would walk back to your seat, no doubt you would glance up at the scoreboard to see what you missed. Because the scoreboard has all of the answers. Actually, that's true in, in any sport. That's why it's called a scoreboard. And when the game is over, fans will take a picture with the scoreboard, especially if their team won. And they focus and they point to that final score. Your eyes are, are fixed and drawn to that which reveals who is the winner and who is the loser. Because there are no ties in the Super Bowl. Either you win or you lose. And today we come to a section in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus digs into a topic that, that we all need to hear about. And it's an area where the world loves to keep score. And Jesus is going to talk about money and how much we accumulate and, and keep and how to approach treasures in this world. So take your Bible out or your mobile device and I'm gonna invite you to turn to Matthew chapter six it's the very start of your New Testament. Uh, it's about two-thirds of the way back if you have an old New Testament. And Jesus is going to drive home this concept of where's your focus? What is it that you are, are busy pursuing? And in Matthew chapter six, in the opening four verses, he basically asks this question. He says, are you consumed with yourself? Now he says that 
20 centuries ago, long before we even had social media accounts. But he asks his listeners that question. Are you, are you consumed with yourself? In verses 15 through 18, or 5 through 18, he essentially challenges them by saying, are you seeking the approval of others? You know, who, whose approval are you looking for in this life? Later in the chapter, in verses 25 through 34, he, he talks about, are you focusing on what you don't have? In other words, are you playing the comparison game? But neatly tucked in the middle of Matthew 6, Jesus addresses a topic that is timeless and one that we still struggle with today. We'll pick it up in Matthew 6 and verse 19. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We have this tendency to want to accumulate, to to stockpile, to protect, to insure. Now, those things aren't aren't bad things uh, unless we focus too much on them or hold on too dearly to our money or our possessions or our clothing or our house or, or our cars. They can distract us from our main purpose while we're here on this earth. You know, Jesus said a whole lot when he, when, when he walked on, on the earth for 33 years about this topic of money. He shared all sorts of stories. He shared parables. That's normally how he, he taught. He told 38 different parables. 16 of the 38 dealt with money and possessions. If you look through your Bible at the different things that Jesus had to, to say that are recorded for us, if you looked at verses that dealt with issues of faith or faith, there would be around 500 verses that would deal with that. If you looked at how much he talked about prayer, there would be 500 verses on prayer. If you looked at money and resources, you would find Jesus talking about that in 2,000 different verses. Well, why is that? Well, it's because simply money affects every single aspect of our daily lives. And we think about it from the second that we wake up, and sometimes it even keeps us awake at night. And Jesus opens his section up by saying, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now let's dissect that just a a, a little bit. That, That word lay up means to amass or reserve or to treasure or to hoard. So literally what we, we could say is it could read, don't treasure treasures. And that's not easy because it's hard for us to not find our value in how much we have. It brings us comfort and security, not to have to depend on anyone. The more things you have, the less you feel like you need the involvement of others or the less you think you need God involved in your life. And in our culture, we celebrate uh, when a person has wealth. Why? It's because they're independent. We think they, they don't need others. It's not true, but that's what we think. Jesus continues by saying, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, you have to understand what's going on. Back then, a person... They would not break into a house by going through the door. They would, that was usually pretty secure, but they would just go through the walls and they would make a hole. They would dig a hole through and then they would make that hole a little bit bigger until they could reach in or or they could go in and they could take things out. You see, back then they didn't put their their wealth or their money in, in bank accounts. Instead, what they would do is they would either give it to someone that would, would hold that money for them, a money changer, or they would deposit it in the temple, or they would hide it, or they would bury it in the ground. And that's how they guarded their belongings, by, by storing or, or hoarding precious metals and, and clothes. But their expensive apparel... Moths could get in, and a moth would would eat holes in that. And as a result, it it would become worthless, and it would be destroyed. And the word destroy here means several different things. It means to render unapparent. In other words, wealth is here, and then all of a sudden, it's gone. You say, well, I sure am glad that I'm I'm living in 2019, and and it's not going to disappear that quickly. Well, 
did you get your statement in the middle of January of your retirement account fund and what happened in the last quarter of 2018? And it took a big dip in most funds. And so we have to recognize that yes, there will be things that come our way. Markets will fluctuate. There'll be theft, there'll be car accidents, there'll be a business partnership that goes sideways, a marriage that goes south, a health problem, a, a can't miss investment that misses. And things can change quite quickly. I love the message paraphrase of Proverbs chapter 23, verses four and five. It says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Restrain yourself. Riches disappear in the blink of an eye. Wealth sprouts wings and flies off into the wild blue yonder. Dave, are you saying that we shouldn't have a, a savings account or we shouldn't have a retirement fund or an emergency fund? No, I'm not saying that at all. Jesus himself says, anyone who doesn't take care of their family is worse than an unbeliever. It's worse than an infidel, he says. I'm not saying you should be apathetic about your finances, but I am reminding you to never allow your accumulation of things or the lack thereof, or to never allow a financial number to determine your worth to others or your worth to God. We just sang a song about how Jesus Christ is madly in love with you. And he is madly in love with you whether you are wildly wealthy or you are a penniless person. Jesus loves you. And at Calvary, he communicated that to you, that he loved you, and that he would do anything for you because you have valued him. You were bought with his blood. And so while your financial portfolio and our nation's economy may have swings and shifts at times, your eternal portfolio that you have invested in will never have a down quarter. It will never decline. I, I grew up, my dad was a preacher. When I was a real little kid, we didn't have junior church yet, so I would be in the worship service listening to him and, and I always say, Dad, do you have a joke in your sermon? He'd say, yeah, I've got a joke in the middle of my sermon. You'd be listening for it. So, oh. so I'd sit out there. I couldn't wait for him to get to that joke, and I would listen. And there was a joke that he used to say sometimes when he would travel, and he would do revivals, and I would go with him. He would tell about a church pastor that was sitting in his office, and the church phone rang, and, and he answered the phone. He said, Pastor Smith, this is the IRS. We're auditing one of your church members. Can you help us? He said, I can. Do you know a Ted Houlihan? I do. Is he a member of your congregation? He is. Did he give $10,000 to your church? He will. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to giving, the Bible talks about a percentage, not an amount. It's a percentage that we give back to the Lord. And we're all in on the play. It's introduced in the first book of, of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. It's talked about throughout the Old Testament. Talked about in the New Testament as well. Talked about in the last book of the Old Testament. And it's in God's own words. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. This is God speaking. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, well, how are we robbing you? in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. As far as I know, this is the only place in all the entire Bible where God says, test me. You put me to the test. I, I double dog dare you to try this. So like today, evidently back then, there were some who were holding on and holding back from what belonged to God. But what about those who say, well, tithing is an Old Testament teaching and is never mentioned or encouraged in the New Testament. Well, let's look at the words of Jesus because Jesus did talk about tithing. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, he's talking to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
You give a tenth of your spices. In other words, you're very meticulous about to make certain that you give 10%. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Look what he says next. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So if tithing were no longer a New Testament practice, this would have been a perfect time for Jesus to say, you know what, hey, forget all that tithing stuff. I've come on the scene now. There's a new covenant. You give whatever you want to. He could have said that. In fact, throughout this entire Sermon on the Mount, think about all the things that he says. You have heard it said that, and then he says, but I tell you, and he elevates the standard. He changes it from this standard to this standard. So he could have done that with tithing, but he doesn't do that. Instead of rebuking them for tithing on the smallest of spices, he tells them that they shouldn't neglect that. In other words, keep doing that, but don't neglect the more important matters of the law either. In fact, throughout the New Testament, the concept of giving is all about giving as you have been prospered or as you've been blessed. And so if the tithe was before Jesus came on the scene, it's got to make us wonder if we should give more or less in light of the Holy Spirit, salvation, forgiveness. Why would God want 10% of my money? Why would God want 10% of your money? I mean, does, does, he, does he need it when you get your paycheck? Is he like, oh, boy, good, it's, it's payday for UPS this week. Whoa. No, I don't think he's saying that. I think instead he is trying to get us to demonstrate our obedience and trust. It communicates that we believe that he can make 90% go farther than we can make 100% go. And some of you are thinking, well, I don't, I don't make much money. Can my meager gifts really have an impact? Well, if it's given with a pure motive and if it's given cheerfully, God can do something significant with it. When you give to the Lord's work, you're storing up treasures in heaven. Your generosity and your kingdom efforts are connecting people to Jesus and one another, locally, regionally, nationally, globally. Every time you make a gift to Southeast Christian, 20% goes away from this church to advance the gospel, a double tithe. So when you give to, a, you give a dollar to this church, 20 cents of it is being used to literally help dozens and dozens of ministries that we have vetted and that we have studied and that we have worked with, over 100 missionaries, 37 different ministries within the greater Louisville area, like Love City or FCA or Scarlet Hope. Uh, we just had, uh, middle school just had the Believe Conference. Uh, we, we had almost 1,000 Kids go, go to that. We had 21 kids that made first-time decisions. We had 13 decisions uh, to be baptized last night from this campus alone, changing the world for Christ now and in the future. Portland Promise Center, Shawnee Christian Health Clinic, Recenter Ministries, Life in Abundance, Beside You for Life. I could go on and on. And when you give to this church, you're giving to all of those ministries. But here's our problem. When it comes to being generous with those who are less fortunate or with our church, we don't really believe that giving has more of a gain than keeping has. We just think it seems backwards. Boy, if I held on to it and I just kept it for myself, I, I could do so many more things. I, I, I think that what's happened is in our advanced culture, we don't have moth and rust destroying our, our money, but now what we have is we have our money destroying us and consuming us. And some of the wealthiest people in the world have everything to live on, but they have nothing to live for. And if you fixed your eyes on the things you thought would free you from the worries of life and, and accumulating those things, then, then what happens is you, you begin to look at life a little bit differently. And there are others who, who don't have much financially, and you are consumed by what you don't have, and you fixate on that. Well, I don't have this, I don't have that, and you play the comparison game. Whether you're wealthy apart from Christ or whether you are poor apart from Christ, both are dangerous places to be because you're looking at the wrong thing on the scoreboard. 
you're looking at the wrong part. Jesus says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust can destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Two takeaways today. If money defines you, it will destroy you. If money defines you, it will destroy you. If this becomes what you are all about, you'll experience some seasons of happiness in this life, but it can rob you of, of ultimate joy. Now, I know a number of, of wealthy people in our church who have joy and peace. And I know many people in our church who are barely getting by, living paycheck to paycheck, and they have joy and peace. But in both cases, it's primarily because they haven't made money their pursuit. And their wealth or their poverty does not define who they are. Jesus Christ defines who they are. You see, we're always believing that, you know, if I, if I just made a little bit more, most studies show that if you had 20% more than you currently make, then you would be happy. Everything would be fine. Doesn't matter if you make $30,000, doesn't matter if you make $200,000. If you had 20% more, oh, everything would be fine. And we're always believing that if we just had a little bit more, if I had a little bit more money, well, then I'd be generous. If I had a little bit more money, well, then I'd be out of debt. If I had a little bit more money, and it, we never end up doing it. Can I tell you something? You will always struggle to be generous if you have not learned to be content with what you have. It starts with contentment. Paul says in Philippians, he says, I have learned to be content in any and every situation, whether in plenty or in want. He said, I've learned the secret of being content. What's the secret of being content? It's found later in Philippians chapter three, verse 10. He says, I wanna know Christ. Christ is the secret of your contentment. If you've got Christ, you begin to say, these other things don't become as important to me. Back in 1987, on a commuter flight from Portland, Maine to Boston, the pilot heard an unusual noise near the rear of the plane. And Henry Dempsey turned the controls over to the co-pilot and he went back to check it out. When he reached the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket and Dempsey was tossed against the rear door. But the original noise was caused because the rear door had not been latched properly prior to takeoff. And now the impact of his weight caused the door to open and Dempsey was instantly sucked out of the tiny jet. The co-pilot saw the red light that indicated an open door. He radioed to the nearest airport requesting permission for an emergency landing. He reported that the pilot had fallen out of the plane. He wanted a helicopter to begin searching that particular area. And after the plane landed, the ground crew found Dempsey holding on to the outdoor ladder of the aircraft. So evidently what happened was when the door opened, somehow he had the wherewithal at the last second just to grab out and he grabbed a hold of this ladder. The plane was flying at 200 miles per hour at an altitude of 4,000 feet. He held on for nearly 10 minutes. When the plane landed, he had 12 inches of leeway to keep from his head bouncing and hitting the runway. My favorite part of the story was the conclusion. It took airport personnel several minutes to pry Dempsey's fingers from the ladder. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, can you imagine? It's okay, Mr. Dempsey, you can let go. You can let go, right? I can't imagine. But I've seen some people who hold on to money and possessions like it is their very life and they grab hold with a white knuckle intensity. And you will hold on to your money and you will never release it until something comes along that has captured your heart. And then and only then will you loosen your grip. Whatever owns you is what you will serve. Later in this particular chapter, in Matthew chapter six and verse 24, Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Is it any wonder that Jesus says, don't treasure treasures? If money defines you, it will destroy you. 
Here's the other takeaway, number two. When Jesus defines you, he will direct you. He will lead you what you need to give. I don't need to get up here and berate you. I don't need to get up and and beg for you to be generous to the Lord's work week in and week out. If Jesus is the Lord of your your life and your heart, you will want to be generous. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your heart belongs to Jesus, you'll be more prone to want to hold on loosely to the things of this world. And the result is you begin to share what you've been blessed with and you, you do it wherever you are, whatever the setting. Maybe it's opening your home to others. Maybe it's, it's writing a check to someone in need. Maybe it's taking God up on that test and you choose to start try, tithing as an expression of your trust in him. Maybe it's helping a ministry-minded high school senior to have the money to attend a, a, a Bible college. Maybe it's paving the way for a student to go to summer camp that couldn't go otherwise or, or to go to Bible and Beach. When I leave Southeast in a few months, there's gonna be some things that I take with me. But I think the greatest thing that I'm gonna take with me is the joy of giving that you all have taught me. And in 30 years, I've learned so much. I've learned so much about giving from you all. And I've seen you give. I've, I've, I've heard the stories of, of anonymous giving where people just go out of their way to do something. I, I've seen people make huge sacrifices. I've seen people give up things in order to have the gospel advance in some way, for a new campus to be built or, or for something to take place to where it has nothing to do with them, it has everything to do with something else. This church has taught me the joy of giving. And I pray that... Uh, a year from now, Kyle calls me up and he just says, man, we've got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, you know what? We, we, we've run out of missionaries. We've run out of groups that we can help out. Do you know of anybody who's trying to advance the gospel that we could partner with because the church is so generous, we just can't keep up with the people. You see, it's fun when you have the opportunity to, to give to someone else. Some, there's a person in our church that sometimes will come to my wife and they'll say, I've got a gift for you, but it's not for you. And your job is just to take this money and, and to, to give it to people within the church who are going through a rough time. And, and you say, well, that's not the smartest thing in the world for him to do. He's missing out on the tax deduction. If he just hands it to your wife and, and says, some people that you know they're going through a hard time, will, will you minister to them? But he doesn't do it for a tax deduction. Can I tell you, my wife has so much, it's so much fun to give somebody else's money away. (laughs) But that's at the heart of generosity for all of us. Because when we learn and we realize it's not ours anyway. It's his all along. It never was ours. When we made Jesus our Lord, he takes over everything in every area. When you give your heart to Jesus, your treasure will follow your heart. Later in this chapter, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus puts it all in perspective on what it is that we should pursue. In verse 33, he says this, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom. Too often we're, we're concerned about building and stockpiling for our kingdom. He says, do it for my kingdom. And possessions are no longer your pursuit. Christ has become the priority. And then you do that whether you have a little or whether you have a lot. It really doesn't matter because you are storing up rewards in heaven. You're just sending it on ahead. And the world wants you to accumulate and hoard and hold tightly to all that you can. But Jesus says, you store up heavenly treasures. You become a conduit on my behalf Luke chapter 16, verse nine, I love this. It says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Keep that up there for just a second. You gotta understand this. What's taking place here is the real concept of this this last phrase in here is if you are investing in the lives of others, if you're trying to draw people closer into a relationship with Jesus Christ, What happens is 
those people invariably will come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Jesus says, guess what? Some of them may be the ones who welcome you into heaven. Can you imagine that moment? Somebody that you paid their way to go to summer camp at church and make a decision for Christ totally changes the trajectory of life and then you walk into heaven and they're the person that greets you. They got there before you did. And God just points over there and says, there's your return on your investment. You have some heavenly investments made? I don't know how much longer the Lord can wait before he returns, but we have to have a sense of urgency If you believe that there's a place called hell and that those who reject Jesus Christ will be assigned there for all eternity, then stands the reason out of love for the lost, we would want to be wise about how we use our resources. Many of you know the name Wayne Smith. Wayne Wayne preached in Lexington, Kentucky for decades. I did my internship with Wayne when I was 20 years old. Uh, He was fiery and he was hilarious. And usually when I share a Wayne Smith story or quote with you, It's usually a joke, something funny, but not this one. One time after a sermon, Wayne was asked by one of his church members, if I don't tithe, will I go to hell? And Wayne said, no, but somebody will. Somebody will. I wonder how many more could be reached if we loosened our grasp and adjusted our priorities You'll probably watch the Super Bowl tonight, and if you do, I promise you at some point in the game, there will be a holding penalty. There'll be a holding penalty called on a player, and it will negate a really big play, a big gain by his teammate. One of our church members, Eric Wood, he played last nine years as the starting center for the Buffalo Bills until he suffered a career-ending injury. I I was talking with him recently about football, and we got talking about holding And uh, I said, I bet it's tough to do when you're trying to protect the quarterback and you got these people trying to go through you and you're you're just trying not to hold them but to keep them at at, at bay. He said, listen, when a 320-pound angry man knocks you off balance, he said, your tendency is to want to hold and to want to grab, but you have to fight that urge and you have to learn to let go or you could cost your team in a really big way. He said, I've done it before and it's not a good feeling. And I think he's right. We run into problems when we grab hold and we hold on too long. Let me tie it together for you this way. Here's what Eric said. Think of it like this. If you are a Christ follower, there's someone who is angry about that, and that's Satan. And Satan is angry that you're following Christ. And so what's his goal? His goal is to knock you off balance. And very often he likes to use money and resources to knock us off balance because he can do that with the person who's poor. He can do that with the person who's wealthy. So he tries to knock you off balance so that your tendency is to wanna grab and hold. And so you just hold on and you hoard and you keep it all. This is mine. This is my little empire. But look what he goes on to say. You have to fight that urge. You have to learn to let go because if you don't let go, it could cost our team. It could slow us down in our efforts of trying to make a difference and advance the gospel. Money is a tool which God puts in our hands to enable us to develop discipline, to build character, to invest in our eternal portfolio, to help others come to Christ. Money is a good servant, but it is a terrible master. And money loses its power over us when we share it, when we give it, when we release it to those in need when we release it to kingdom purposes and trust that God can do more with it than we ever could. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, uh, we thank you that you set the example for us. <laughs> All we have to do is see John three sixteen. You loved the world so much that you gave. You gave your one and only son. And Lord, I pray that this will not be a message that is remembered about money, but I pray that it will be a message about our heart belonging to you. So will you help us to give freely?
ourselves to you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.